I'd like to assure you that in some ways this debate is not about engineering. In lots of ways it's about how we view the future, how we view risk, how we view human uh, interaction with both nature and society. But we also have some expert engineers on the panel too. And engineering has never been far from the headlines of late. The engineering feat of rescuing the miners in Chile was obviously something that kept us all gripped. The failure of engineering, maybe, in relation to deep sea oil drilling also kept us uh, gripped, although maybe engineering also solved that problem. But we're all aware of at least uh, the fact that engineering has both solved problems and some might say, in, in some instances, has created some problems. So James Dyson, who is an alumni from this esteemed establishment, the Royal College of Art, has actually argued uh, quite vociferously and a lot recently that engineering is a key to economic growth. But as I've said, this is not a policy debate on engineering so much. This is about the future and it's about the precautionary principle. And I wanted to have the word utopian in the title because I wanted to suggest, and what we were thinking about was, when we say engineering the future, we wanted to think about whether our capacity to imagine a better future and issues like engineering being employed for that purpose was actually in jeopardy today because we're too worried about risks and we're too cautious. I'd really like to thank both the Royal Academy of Engineering who gave us uh, both the title Engineering the Future and have been a partner with us on today's venture and this debate and also to thank uh, Jaguar Land Rover who's been the engineering champion um, at this festival as well. First of all we've got um, uh, next to me, Professor Andy, uh, uh, Andrew Sterling, who's Research Director at SPRU, the, the Science and Technology Policy Research uh, Group, and he's also co-director of the ESRC-funded STEPS Centre, all at the University of Sussex. He's co-author of Dynamic Sustainabilities, uh, Technology, Environment and Social Justice, and has a background both in the natural and the social scientist. He's been an archaeologist, he's worked in the environment and peace movements, and his main area of research has been policy challenges of scientific uncertainty, innovation for sustainability, and technology and democracy. He's been up on public advisory bodies in relation to EU energy policy and um, uh, the science review panel on GM foods. And that's only a, a smidgen of his uh, biography. Next uh, to me on this side is Ed Daniels, who's Executive Vice President of Shell's Projects and Technology Organisation. He has a Master's of Chemical Engineering from Imperial, worked in Singapore and has been in charge of marketing across Asia and Pacific and in Houston, Texas, and is a fellow of the Institution of Chemical Engineers. And as people will know, Shell are, are one of the headline partners of this year's Battle of Ideas. <coughs> the, the interesting thing is, is that when people sort of say, you know, big oil and all the rest of it, what people forget sometimes is the feat of engineering to get the oil out of the ground. Now, some people might, might want it to stay there, but as a feat of engineering, this is hugely impressive. So we're delighted to have you here, Ed. You. We then have Dr. Bill de Rodier, who is a senior fellow at the Centre for Non-Traditional Security Studies at RSIS at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. He's spoken at the Battle of Ideas uh, over a number of years. He was just saying only one year he hasn't, and he's one of our favourite speakers. He's written an excellent battle in print on Is the West Still the Best? on that keynote. His main research is understanding the causes and consequences of contemporary perceptions of uh, risk. He's a well-renowned speaker internationally and uh, writes widely. He was a regular in the media in the UK when he lived here and was an advisor on Adam Curtis's The Power of uh, Nightmares. And he previously has uh, been a teacher at Cranfield University and King's College London. So it's delighted, we're delighted to have you back uh, from afar, Bill. And then finally, uh, Dr. S uh, Scott Stedman, who's been the Vice President of both the Institution of Civil Engineers and the Royal Academy of Engineering, our partner today. He's the Editor-in-Chief of the Academy's flagship magazine, Ingenua, which is on, around the building. Uh, in fact, there's not many of them left, because a lot of them have gone. He, it's a great magazine. Uh, he spent the last 20 years working on uh, major infrastructure and building projects in the UK and around the world. Um, he specialises, again, in risk and natural disasters and forensic engineering, um, and he's lectured at Cambridge University. 
Excitingly, he scripted and presented the 13-part series for Discovery channels on how did they build that uh, about Egyptian, Greek, and Roman engineering. But can we uh, welcome an excellent panel? Um, Andrew, if you can kick us off, please. Yep. Thanks very much, Claire. I, I await with some trepidation being uh, stumped back by the chair. I have no idea what my colleagues on the panel are going to say. I'm looking forward to hearing it. Um, but one thing's for sure. When we find ourselves gathered together in various ways to discuss issues like this, engineering the future, science, technology, democracy, the topic uh, usually gets treated in, it, it's full of all sorts of lamentations and gnashings of teeth. And the kinds of issues that crop up is, why does the public suffer from such anti-technology anxieties, particularly in the UK and Europe? Um, as if concerns over particular technologies were generic to all technology. We hear when we face these big set-piece debates over genetic engineering or nuclear engineering, um, how can we ensure that decisions are more science-based? As if science will tell us what to do on these kinds of issues. We hear about well, let's build more pro-innovation policies. This is a mantra throughout uh, uh, industrialized countries. As if innovation were one thing, as if it was a homogenous thing. Now, uh, Scott's colleague, uh, Lord Browers, the president, past president of the uh, Royal Academy of Engineering, in a really eloquent uh, wreath lectures he did a number of years ago, put it very well. He described, and I quote, I think, history is the race to advance technology. What's, what do we know about races? They're along a track. It goes in one direction. There's a limited number of things you can do. You can go faster, slower, it can be more or less efficient. It's the future in this model is a single inevitable thing. The issues for debate are how fast or slow or efficiently who's leading in terms of getting there. Now, in the re present remit for this set, uh, session, uh, this is very much the model that's picked up. We hear a call for today's young engineers and scientists to shape tomorrow as well. This is what we're debating now. now just for the sake of a, uh, an animated debate, I think uh, Institute of Ideas, Royal Academy of Engineering, in respect to those kinds of framings, have got it wrong. Uh, and it's no slight to science, technology, or engineering to say this. Engineering, science, technology are absolutely essential to a well-functioning society and a democracy as well. But they are so as capable servants, not dominating masters. And James Dyson, again, was very well quoted in the blurb for this session when he said that we should have aspirational visions of the future. They're absolutely necessary. The point is, the real value of scientists and engineers lies in presenting choices for these visions, not in compulsions as to which we should pick up. And it is in open political debate and democratic accountability that we should look for the driving seat. And there is a danger, not, I'm sure, shared by actual engineers or scientists and technologists, that very strong, narrow, closed, unaccountable interests operate behind this generic language, pro-innovation or engineering should decide our future, and conceal themselves. Now, how can I say this? I've already talked about science and technology and interest. Surely, science and technology about what works, uh, what's true, it's not got to do with social interests. It's independent of it. And it's easy to caricature what I'm saying as a kind of in name calling, anything goes, relativism, everything's equally true, or everything could work equally well, and to denigrate the work of engineers, which I am absolutely not doing. My point is that just because some things are just plain wrong or just plain won't work doesn't mean there are a number of different things that are equally true, and things can work in a number of different ways. So engineering, in this context, provides options, but its society should make the choices. And just as it's important not to be romantic about the technical specialist knowledge of the members of the public and society, so too we shouldn't be romantic about the limits to the agency of engineering. Every single discipline that looks at the nature of the dynamics of science and technology and engineering comes up with the same basic picture. History, economics, philosophy, politi politics, social science, there are many possible branching paths for technologies in any given area, transport, energy, um, materials. And we close down to a subset of those paths, not because they're inevitable, but because of social and political forces. The QWERTY keyboard is a fantastic example of that, a mid-19th century mechanical typewriter design that despite it causing RSI and other ailments, we cannot wean ourselves away from it. But the same is true of light water reactors. It's not an anti-nuclear point compared to other reactors. It, it doesn't work well for civilian power production. It was a, it was a military uh, for the confined spaces of submarines that it was developed, and we can't get off it. 
AC electricity, Windows software, etc., etc. So there are powerful forces taking us down these channels, not the inevitabilities of engineering. Now, why does this matter? Well, looking forward to the future, which is the topic of this session, everywhere in science and technology, we see a big picture of choice. It's not about being pro-innovation, pro-engineering. It's choice. Genetic engineering, we speak of it in blanket terms, but there are enormous political economic differences between, even in that narrow field, marker-assisted breeding, transgenics, cisgenics, apomixis. I'm, I'm not going to go into the details. These things have to do with intellectual property and other factors have enormous implications. If we just lump it together. Likewise, neuroscience, nanotechnology, robotics. Um, are we driving these things through security and military aims or through other public uh, good social drivers? At the moment, it is the case that one-third, conservatively, of world effort on innovation and research is spent in the premeditated planning for perpetrating organized violence. Military expenditure. One-third of our resources in engineering. So we are making social and political choices, but we're doing it without discussing them. We're doing it blindly, even unconsciously. And even in climate change, where one might suppose the constraints that we're now facing, the ambitions we have for transforming society are so uh, demanding, we can still see choices. For instance, we could, if we wished, adopt a centralized, high-security, global nuclear industrial system, which would effectively address the problem of climate change. Uh, we could look at cross-continental renewable energy infrastructures, moving hydrogen around as a carrier, using the Sahara Desert for solar arrays and so forth. This could work. We could continue using fossil fuels, but with carbon capture technologies. We could go for new smart grids for distributed energy and integrated energy services in a completely radical reform of the, of the system that way. Each of these is technically possible in, in a period of decades we're talking about. Each is economically feasible and socially viable, but we cannot simultaneously realize the promise of all of them. We are making choices. We have to make choices. So the real questions then are, not about whether simply to trust the visions of engineers, because all of these have visions of engineers. The question is, which engineers? In what fields? Inspired by what? Funded by whom? To what ends? We should be debating these things. And also about power, the exercise of power. It's not a nasty word, but we should be talking about it behind the scenes. So I think I probably should begin to wind up. Um, debates about science and technology and engineering, I think, uh, should, to be put it bluntly, should grow up. We talk about politics in other areas, criminal justice, education, welfare. We don't say when somebody criticizes a policy, well, you're just being anti-policy. But in technology, we routinely say you're being anti-science. If you don't like the incumbent dominant version, you're anti-science generally or anti-technology generally. And I think that's really an immature way of discussing it. Um, engineers should absolutely be respected and valued, not for helping us to win the race down some shingle track, but for opening up for society exhilarating vistas of diverse possible choices. So in the end, the answer to this question that Claire's posed for this session, can we make a compelling case for engineering the future, driven by utopian visions? Absolutely yes. But engineers should stick to where they're brilliant, engineering things. It is people, society, debates, political, democratic accountability that should be engineering our futures. I've got a quotation from Buckminster Fuller to start, which seems to sort of highlight how important this debate is. Uh, he said in his uh, work, Critical Path, think of it. We are blessed with a technology that would be indescribable to our forefathers. We have the wherewithal, the know-it-all, to feed everybody, clothe everybody, and give everybody on earth a chance. We know now what we could never have known before, that we have the option for all humanity to make it successfully on this planet in this lifetime. Whether it is to be utopian or oblivion will be a touch and go relay race right up to the final moment. So uh, we're not the first people to have thought about this particular challenge about what, uh, what the future holds for us uh, with respect to engineering. My sort of opening remark really is that I, I have a firm belief that it is part of the human condition that we seek to solve problems that we seek to understand the world that we live in and we seek to make things better and to improve our lot. I think that's deeply embedded in every one of us in, in its own ways. Whether you go back to the Romans, you look at Copernicus, you look at Galileo Galilei, uh, Newton, Brunel, all of these great thinkers, scientists, engineers thought about issues and problems, tried to understand them and tried to make the world a better place. 
through their science and, and engineering. And those great discoveries that were made led through to the Industrial Revolution, uh, the current technological revolution we have around the internet, and have been inter inter interacting and changing elements of mankind as those uh, great scientific discoveries and engineering uh, activities have gone forward. And through that, we've made great strides. Uh, as Buckminster Fuller said in my quotation earlier, you know, if you think about what's happened even in the last hundred years, let alone the last thousand years, about you know, medicines and life expectancy around what, we, what has been done, although much yet left to do around famine, hunger, uh, poverty, around what happens now in terms of communications, travel, you name it, trade, etc. These have all uh, vastly improved the lot of humankind. And for me, engineering has played a real role in that. I don't think it's for the engineers to decide everything, but equally, I think the scientists and the engineers have really helped us drive uh, humankind forward. If I relate that now, though, to where we, where we stand today, and, and uh, you'll forgive me for using examples from the industry that I'm most familiar with, we find ourselves, I think, today with some enormously challenging issues and problems. The one, as I said, I'm most familiar with for me is, is the energy challenge, the energy challenge that our planet has, that, you know, if you fast forward the tape 50 years or so, the world's population will go from 6 billion to 9 billion by most commentators' uh, estimates, and uh, the amount of energy that we'll need to keep those 9 billion people happy uh, is about uh, a sort of double the amount that we have today. There are not only more and more consumers coming onto the, uh, the planet, but also those consumers want the luxuries, like air conditioning that I notice is slightly uh, absent from this room. But, uh, you know, who are we to say that new consumers, whether it's in China or in India or in Indonesia or other emerging economies, can't have um, the great innovations that we have had? The party has been in full flow, the champagne has been flowing, new people are arriving. It's not for us to say, I'm sorry, this party's not for you, you can go back to where you came from. The challenge that we've got with this, with this energy challenge is, is not only to try and find enough energy to, to satisfy those 9 billion people and their hopes and aspirations, but also to do that in a sustainable way, that we don't actually destroy the very planet uh, that we sit upon. And for me, innovation and engineering is a fundamental part of how we will tackle that and many of the other problems that we have on the planet. And, and I don't think, I don't think um, there's a, an acceptable solution by just burying our head in the sand and hoping that it all goes away. In fact, uh, I think it gets a lot worse. Um, work that we've done uh, in Shell, where I work, look, we've done some scenario thinking about what are plausible futures uh, for what the world could look like in 2050. Uh, and we came up with these two alternative worlds, one we called Scramble, which is where all nations and people just do exactly what they want to do, a sort of an element of chaos theory, I suppose, and then a, sl a slightly more managed future of how, through science and engineering, we create structures and manage things, just like, uh, Andy, you were describing about trying to put in place uh, things that we manage things across geographical boundaries, uh, across national boundaries. The difference between those scramble and blueprints futures is enormous in terms of the amount of um, health we can restore to the planet through better management of our resources. So engineers have a huge role to play. Having said that, when you do the mathematics and you put in all of the innovation we can think of, it's biofuels, it's uh, carbon capture and storage, it's nuclear reactors, it's uh, wind, it's wave, it's solar, and I'm sure there's plenty more on the list that we can add. When you, when you add all those things together, that still does not get us into a place where we can manage uh, to satisfy those 9 billion people that will be around in 2050. So, not only do we have to have an engineering utopia view of the future, we also have to modify behaviours. Now, that's... Uh, that's partly going to be driven by individuals, it's partly going to be driven by uh, companies and institutions, and it's also going to be driven by governments. So all of those actors are going to have to play their role in how we shape uh, that future going forward. It's not uh, been uh, out of the news for very long, the sort of Gulf of Mexico issues around exploring energy, I'm sure, are uppermost in, in many people's minds. And this brings to me... Uh, 
I don't think we can bury our head in the sand and hope these things go away. I think in, in managing these enormous and complex challenges of engineering around the world, whether they're in, in uh, the energy industry or many other industries, we have to get a better appreciation, understanding of risk, and then how we manage and mitigate those risks. I feel that um, it is wrong to assume that engineers know all of the answers. It's through critical debate of risk and risk mitigation that I think we can avoid the sort of Macondo uh, Gulf of Mexico issues uh, in the future. I'm going to try and close a little now and, and sort of summarize for you, you know, what, I, what I feel, that we are a curious uh, animal. The human being is a curious animal that wants to improve its lot, and I don't think we can get away from that. The particular challenge I spoke to you about, the energy challenge, I think we have to innovate. I think we have to build a sustainable energy future through innovation, through engineering and science. It's going to be a multiple approach of bio, wind, solar, carbon capture and storage, nuclear, you name it, and the ability to change behaviors of people on the planet through those institutions. So for me, it's not a choice of engineering utopia or changing behaviors. In fact, uh, perhaps predictably, it's a little bit of both. Kishore Mahubani is the, uh, was the Permanent Secretary to the Cabinet in Singapore, also an uh, ambassador to the United Nations, now Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School. And uh, in his book, The New Asian Hemisphere, which I recommend to you all, he reminisces about his youth, and he reminisces about Singapore in the 50s and his seeing the first flushing toilet arriving. And what a revolution that was to his life and the life of, uh, of their neighbours. And then he goes through the other waves of technology that arrived, Finishing for him with the, the television, which opened his mind to a world that he'd never seen and to possibilities that he hadn't imagined but thought that everybody should deserve and helped fire his imagination as to what's possible out of life. And I think, you know, in some ways, when we discuss engineering, we should remind ourselves that it's not simply about making life comfortable, increasing GDP, uh, or anything like that. It's also about inspiring people to see beyond their immediate circumstances, and that obviously had that effect on Kishore. I think part of what we're about in life is to make the world more habitable for ourselves, but also more enjoyable. Brunel, who's already been mentioned when he built the Great Eastern uh, about 160 years ago, not a lot of people may know this, but people from all over the globe came to Millwall to see the building of the Great Eastern. People and princes from all over Europe, it was a whole phenomenon, the largest ship that had ever been built quite small by today's standards. And it's actually, to me, my, my concern is that when's the last time that you saw that happen? People went to see and be inspired by something phenomenal, you know, to get their imagination fired. For me, it was possibly the moon landings. I'm just about old enough to remember. Uh, more recently, maybe the Viaduc de Milau in France inspired a lot of people in terms of its, you know, the ability to drive above the clouds on towers higher than the Eiffel Tower. More recently, I was in Shanghai and had the opportunity to ride the maglev train from the airport into town at 431 kilometers an hour, absolutely smoother than any railway you've ever been on. But, you know, those are rare moments, I think, in the contemporary period, and that's what concerns me in relation to this discussion. I think a lot of engineers trained in the West at Imperial College, where Ed and myself went, now look to the East and to the South if they're going to realize any of their imaginative projects to build huge dams, which I know some people on this panel may have concerns with, or airports, or even simply buildings, all of which are stigmatized in the modern world. They're seen as part of the rapacious capitalist drive, uh, you know, controlled by elites that are unaccountable to us. And yet, if we're going to inspire a new generation, maybe we need to be focusing on some of these things. My concern is that contemporary society sees problems everywhere before it's even started doing anything. And by seeing problems everywhere, it fails to seize the opportunities that are there. There are problems, but we learn by taking risks and doing things, not by avoiding risks and doing nothing. There are even extremely big problems, which I am wholeheartedly in support of dealing with, such as climate change. But you know, really big problems require really big solutions. And the problem with much of what's advocated in relation to climate change is that it's micromanagement of behavior, switching off the red dot on your television. Let me assure you, that's not going to resolve the problem. Yeah? If you're worried about carbon, you should note, by the way, that the carbon is produced and released at the power station, not at the switch in your house. 
So asking you to switch the switches off is really an exercise in modifying your behavior and making you feel good. But actually, real savings in carbon would come from more efficient production of energy uh, at power stations. And that's where we need to think big, not small. We need to actually produce more rather than be asked to consume less. In fact, the UK's approach to reducing its carbon outputs has been pretty much threefold, both all of which are petty. One is to close down industry. That's a very effective way of reducing carbon. The other one is to demand that we should all consume less, so it's our fault. Uh, and finally, it's to trade carbon futures with uh, developing countries so that if we're not developing, at least we can count on them not developing either by holding them back. I think, unfortunately, there's too many campaigners in that field who are obsessed with, um, and Andy rightly pointed out, you know, the, the science of climate change. But actually, when you push them, you realize they don't believe in science at all. Because when scientists and engineers come up with possible solutions to climate change, they're really not that interested. Mark Strutt of Greenpeace says, we're looking for reductions in use, not technological fixes. Note the word fixes, by the way. It's all the using the language of drugs to tarnish engineers by association. You, you want a big fix, a bigger dose of technology. You're addicted to technology. The language is endless. Bryony Worthington of Friends of the Earth says, these are crazy engineering solutions. And then she's got the gall to go on to say, you can't be certain they're only models, these solutions. You know, a climate change campaigner complaining about other people's models. The IPCC, notably, has no working group looking at big solutions to the problem of climate change. So really, it's got a confirmation bias, it's got a closed mind as to what it's doing. And every solution that's put forward is dismissed. Nuclear is going to re release waste, hydro is damaging to the environment and people, clean coal is an oxymoron, even wind is held to be unachievable. Unfortunately, I think holding back for fear of running out is a self-fulfilling prophecy. In fact, and maybe counterintuitively, it's only through growth that we can solve the problems of growth. Predictions about the future, and I'll end now on talking about the future, always tell us much more about the present than they tell us about the future. They tell us about people's prejudices and how they project them forwards 20, 30, or 40 years. Science and technology, as well as shaping society, are themselves products of society. Newton wrote in his letter to Hooke of 1676, if I have seen further, it is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. That was both an insult to Hooke, who was famously small, but also a recognition that Newton had that actually the scientific revolution was presupposed by the social revolutions that had predated it, getting rid of the Pope and getting rid of the King and releasing mankind's belief in itself and the potential of transforming its circumstances. And in that regard, I want to finish on this, ideas and culture are just as much material forces as science and engineering. They shape the science and engineering that we develop. A culture of limits, which is the one I suspect we live in, lends itself to engineering around security solutions, which Andy complains about, and also small-scale, micro-scale development, which will not solve big problems. The West, or modernity, was a product of a spirit of freedom and autonomy. And that's why, by the way, despite all the big numbers being in Asia, populations, cities, research and development, PhDs, Asia may not yet take over from the West, because freedom and autonomy still need to be fought for and achieved there. Unfortunately today, I think that rather than using a vision of the future to inspire action in the present to realize that vision, we see projections of dystopian futures through which some, consciously or not, hope to constrain action in the present. <clears throat> Environmentalism sees itself as dynamic and claims the mantle of human agency. In fact, implicitly, it denies agency, projecting it as a dangerous force that needs to be curtailed or controlled. If we fail to engineer the present, let alone the future, we both attenuate our potential and stultify our own spirits, and then our own worst fears will come to pass. Our generation is really very, very unusual. It's the, it's the one generation that will experience the greatest rate of growth of human population in the history of the human race. In the same generation, our generation, will witness the transition from a majority of humans living on the land to a majority living in an urban environment. So our natural environment is now urban, not rural. 
This is a race against time, but it's not a race in Andy's sense that it's a race with a clear finishing point where we all agree to the rules and we start at the same time. It's a race in, in every direction. We need to manage the growth of world population through education and prosperity. These are the only two factors that we know achieve that in a stable way. And we need to do that through slow, steady economic growth, through wealth creation. And we're living longer too. Every, every pension fund meeting I go to, we seem to be living a year longer every year. That is not a sustainable future. I became an engineer to improve the quality of life of everyone, to run in, in Andy's race. But for me, engineering is about providing the physical infrastructure to support society to deliver its full potential. Engineering is not about solving problems. It's a huge misunderstanding which is out there in the, in the media. The real genius of engineering is to understand what the problem is in the first place and then to help society make those choices. So I thought I'd, I'd, I'd try and cover this with three big ideas because it's an ideas debate. First of all, as I've said, we're a global community. Engineers and the engineering way of thinking, which is about a way of taking decisions, has a critical role in shaping those options and in delivering progress. So how can we have a debate about, about few limits to growth? What barriers could there be? You, you usually get two arguments wheeled out about this. Firstly, there's some limit to growth. And secondly, that it's all too difficult to understand, so we won't allow it. That's what's called the precautionary principle. Well, you can look back at the whole history of the human race, and I've no doubt that every single generation, there were people that sat down for supper and said, we're going to run out of beans. And we don't. And we shan't. Because innovation is a remarkable and a very powerful process, but it does require drivers. Drivers can be political, they can be commercial, your shareholders, they might be social, but innovation is not a process that takes place by accident. If, if life is good and there are beans on the table and it's warm and cosy, actually the status quo is very tempting. So risk in that situation, the risk of going outdoors, is not something that people take lightly if it's all very comfortable. But given the right conditions, the only limit to the future is your own imagination. I think actually, with some very obvious exceptions, most of which are in your own pockets, and, and certainly here Andy's iPhone is beside him, large parts of the engineering world have really had a rather quiet few decades. Competition driven by cost, not innovation. Uh, while our processing power of our computers has increased exponentially, many areas of engineering have seen very marginal improvements. The fuel efficiency of cars, for example, I was amazed when the new car I got this year, is significantly better in its efficiency than the last one. But for the last 20 years, they've been about the same. Underground construction, refurbishment of domestic houses, everybody who's having their house done up will tell you it's the same as it always was. So we've not been very good at big chunks of our engineering at actually advancing uh, significantly, and that's because innovation hasn't had a, 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 a route to grab. So the second big idea is that we are today engaged in a paradigm shift that will see a resurgence of ideas and innovation in engineering, unlike anything we've witnessed since the Industrial Revolution. A friend on Friday said that uh, we're entering a new golden age in engineering, and, and I agree with that, except the golden age is a smack of ancient civilizations, and uh, I, we're definitely not turning into an ancient civilization. And if you need evidence to bring it back to, the, to, to, to our own country, you don't need to look very far. A, a driver that's just quietly ticking away at this is the, the fact that the new government did not repeal the Climate Change Act. They didn't repeal the Climate Change Act. So we are set on a trajectory where, where this momentous decision changes the paradigm for engineering for the foreseeable future. Since the Victorian era, engineering decisions have been based ultimately just on cost. You know, what do you want? Okay, I'll try and get the cheapest price, we'll build it. No longer. No longer. The Climate Change Act, whatever you, it's not a debate about climate change. It's a debate about the fact that, that carbon has become a parameter as significant for engineering decisions as cost. So for the first time since the Industrial Revolution, we have a second parameter of equal significance to money. And that will change totally the way that engineers offer those choices that Andy wants us to help society take. The fact that it's emerged from an argument about environmental impact is significant, but it's really it's not the point. 
We've seen over the last 20 years lots of additional requirements bolted onto our work, uh, and, and we have to answer them. You know, health and safety is an obvious example, ecology, biodiversity, being nice to neighbors. All these are bolt-ons, you know, do the engineering design at a price, then tick the boxes. But for the first time now, we have to budget not only for cost, but in our decision-making as a society, we have, to, we have to think about carbon. And in this sense, carbon is, is not really a climate change issue. It's a proxy. It's a proxy for social, environmental, and economic impact. It's a proxy for sustainability. So suddenly, we're making decisions about, about high-speed rail, about, you know, uh, airports, runways, motor cars, congestion charging, not on the basis of pure money, but we do have a sustainability parameter of huge importance in there. And the profession is now trying desperately with government to work out how we actually make those decisions work. What is it going to flush out of the decision-making process? So we're at a confluence of ideas confluence, which is, which is really quite unique. The world population is growing faster than it will ever grow. We are urban, not rural. And engineering is no longer just about cost, it's about performance. So we're here to engage in the debate, and it's really exciting, Claire, that we are. So my third big idea is that the sustainable future is only possible through innovation. Innovation means more for less. More performance for less material. Look all around you, look at the history Look at the, 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 the miniaturization of practically everything. Look at the, the size. Of, do you remember the first mobile phone that came out? I had, to, I had, a, I had a briefcase. I had a mobile phone the size of a you know, briefcase. And, and of course, they're not. So more, more performance, less material. We can engineer now at the level of individual atoms or at the scale of the planet. <coughs> you think of the internet being a sort of planet-sized product. And this is yet another confluence. Which is, which is very unusual, and, and it's never happened before. Science and engineering have, have finally actually converged, because we can engineer at the atomic level, which is something that, that engineers previously were thought of doing, you know, big Brunel bridges and steel and stuff. But now they're actually engineering atoms as well as engineering the planet. So what an opportunity that is. Graphene won the uh, Nobel Prize uh, this summer for its inventors, and we know vaguely as engineers what it might be used for. But the real opportunity is to recognize how those materials can provide a completely new way of meeting a particular need. Plastic electronics, another innovation working its way into the system, smart dust and so on. In the future, we might anticipate engineering embracing not only inert materials, but also living materials. I mean, we, you see this already, we mentioned genetic engineering. But uh, just to, to, to wind up, we, we see in, in resources and infrastructure that permit us all to enjoy a quality of life that liberates the human potential. The fact we're engaged here in debate really shows that we've entered this new paradigm. I've no doubt that the next 10 years in engineering will be the most exciting decade for innovation since the 1950s. It's a transformational moment for engineering and for society. So welcome to the future. Andy, I just, I mean, I absolutely agree with you that um, just because you're an engineer or a scientist, you shouldn't be able to dictate political decisions. But I wonder if you did recognize that there is uh, a climate, I think, at least a cultural uh, climate of pessimism and risk aversion beyond engineering now. I, I'm not just talking about it in terms of engineering, but that there's a kind of uh, sense in which people are nervous about uh, um, the future and so on. Do you recognize that at all, or is that just a, a, an Institute of Ideas uh, a kind of uh, a straw man? It's an Institute of Ideas straw man. Okay. I um, thought I'd get him to say that, and, asking and, the question. And the reason I say that is because, it, for me, it's kind, kind of strange that this hand-wringing about public anxieties is itself a great anxiety. <laughs> and the idea that the public, has, as Bill just put, just put over quite nicely, fear new technologies, I mean, manifestly, that's not the case. Mobile phones, the web, these things have taken off and transformed people's lives in ways that behaviour change specialists can only aspire to do. People love technologies if they're the ones they want. They want to exercise choice. And I, whether I've drunk too much coffee or it was your pep talk, Claire, that we should, this is a debate we should, uh, I mean, I, I've learned an awful lot from my colleagues on what they've said, but nobody's really picked up on this implication of direction of technology. And it's not, if technology can go in different directions, it's not about going forward, it's not about big or small, it, it's not about a race, 
in every direction. I mean, I saw, saw a parent's pancake race at school. Mm. That was in every direction, but I don't think that's the kind of <laughs> race you meant. I mean, if it's a race, it is in a direction. We're not having those debates, and for me, that's the real issue. And, and part of this, this idea that the public, whenever the public mm. speak out of turn to criticising te technology, they get this very anxious back reaction from the Institute of Ideas and many others as well. Strikes me as that, that is the problem. It's stopping us having intelligent, mature debates, politically accountable debates, about the directions of technology. Well, just on the debate point then, just, I just wondered what you thought about the fact that, because you've emphasised choices and debates, that one of the things that I fear is actually going to hold back innovation is actually something that, that Scott referred to, which is the idea that, as well as cost, we have to count carbon. Everything is seen through the prism of carbon. Now, I have to say that when I say I don't think that engineering choices should be seen through the prism of uh, carbon, I'm, t I'm constantly told that we have no choice. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you at least think that we have a choice there, that that is indeed a political choice as to whether we do that? Because for me, it's not as determined. I mean, the climate change bill might force you to do it, mm -hmm. but I think that's a political act, which I completely disagree with, and therefore I think we should have a political debate about that. But whenever I try and have that political debate, I'm told that there's no choice because the science shows. Now, just do you at least concede to, with me that that is bad for engineering in relation to climate change? I, do, I mean, I, I think I share a lot of ground with you, and, and the fact that you organise these events to have exactly these debates shows the, sh the common ground there, Claire. But again, when you said holding us back, <laughs> you can only conceive of being held back, um, and, and um, Scott talked about precaution, I think, uh, in, in these terms, precaution holding back. Look at an example of precaution. We were precautionary about nuclear power. Many people disagree with the grounds for the, for, the, for the shift of trajectory, but it took place. It was only because that took place that small Danish manufacturing companies became multinationals who now build three times more firm energy output in wind turbines than is currently being installed as nuclear. Firm output. Um, that is a, a shift of direction caused by precaution. Precaution is never an open-ended thing. It is always about something in particular. And precaution, to me, encourages us to, to be critical about which paths we want to follow and which not. It's not a holding back thing. That's, uh, well, obviously, I think it is holding back because I want to be able to get home quicker. I want to be able to go on uh, fast trains, not ones that are constantly plagued by being slow. And when the capacity is there for people to be able to, technically, to be able to have flushing toilets, I want them to have the flushing toilets. And I want us to have even more super-duper things. Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, I don't mind us having a debate about it, but let me tell you, we haven't got where I think we could go. Um, but Scott, That's actually, I was slightly nervous about your sustainability point, though, because mm. I have to say that that word, which I know is a weasel word mm. uh, anyway, and it can mean everything, but it often means limits. Mm. And it does mean accepting limits. And even the way you talked about it, it, it for me, it, is, it, it immediately hems everything in. And, you know, it's kind of, it won't be sustainable. It won't be sustainable. So, do you, do you see my nervousness? I do see your nervousness. The direction we're talking about is the direction Claire's just described. It's about a better quality of life for, for the people of the planet. It's, it's, that's the direction. The issue about carbon is very interesting because it's, it's not about that as a particular parameter. If you didn't choose that, you'd have to choose something else. But what it's done for the first time is to break the paradigm that, that everything is driven purely by money. It's engaged another type of parameter, which we have to work out how to use, Claire. And it, it's not obvious how we're going to do that. But it has opened the debate up. I don't think it's about limits. I think it's about <coughs> trying, to, trying to address the values that we ascribe to our engineering solutions. I mean, if you're looking for infrastructure as an example, infrastructure is a kind of overhead on the country. But we want that to be as efficient as possible. To, to the benefit of the people who live in the United Kingdom, our infrastructure for, for a start. And we want it to be as efficient as possible, but, but bearing in mind all these other parameters that we care about. So the debate we're talking about in terms of making choices is how to do that. And should we do that now, or should we wait 50 years, and, and how, much should it, we, we, how much should we dig up, and what should we do, and should we move people? These are about choices. So I'm really excited about this, because I'm really excited, not that, not that it's hemming us in, but it's actually taking the lid off the debate about what values do you want to discuss when we're talking about these huge projects that we all complain about? Moving over to you, Ed, I thought it was absolutely interesting that you, you talked about um, modifying behaviour. I was at a debate, or was doing a debate, and, and there was somebody from a different uh, energy company who, who basically said that they saw themselves as, uh, as being at the forefront of engineering behaviour. 
Now, at this point, I feel like agreeing with Andy, which is to say, <laughs> please keep out. I mean, the idea, I mean, you might be a good engineer, right? And you might be an important energy company, but what are you doing modifying behaviour, for God's sake? Um, I, this has got nothing to do with you. And the fact that all of these energy companies are wandering around telling us how to live in the modification of behaviour sense, uh, making more efficient, uh, creating more efficient solutions, all of these things I can live with. But there is an awful lot of that going on. Now, I'm just wondering whether you're kind of going beyond your brief. I'm not trying to suggest that you can't say, but I mean, going beyond your brief in broad terms. So, so I think uh, it's not for a commercial organisation to go out and tell people how to live their lives. That's well, I mean, as engineers, so, I'm not right. going to go at you. And, and, as, and as, not, as, as engineers, as a... As a as a, a race or whatever we are, uh, to go out and tell people about this. I think we do have a responsibility. If we see a future where without changing our behaviours and our attitudes towards energy efficiency, use of energy and how we use products, that there is going to be a nasty crunching noise where the energy equation doesn't work, I think we have a duty to, to shout that from the rooftops and explain and, and work on the kind of solutions that will help people. So whether it's coming up with better engines that, collaboratively with the motor industry that you know, use less fuel or, or better lubricants that, that make uh, for more efficient um, motor vehicles, better roads that are more efficient to drive on. I think we have a, a duty to explain um, the, the challenges that are ahead and then to put in place some innovation and engineering to try and help um, the population modify behaviours in a way that's not too uh, uh, distracting on their daily lives. Um, a, a question for all of you to consider. I'm, I'm going to build with a specific one, but then I'd like to come back to you all on this. Was we started off this morning, um, I mean, the festival started off this morning with a debate on blue skies thinking. And one of the things which I've found in debates that I've had on university funding and research funding is, is that I'm not a great supporter of the impact agenda and the idea that you have to indicate how useful your uh, research will be before you've done it. Um, and then there's sort of always a bit of a spat between the humanities and, and sciences for a start off. But there's also a little bit of a spat between the sciences and engineers, which is the engineers look as though um, they, they can prove their impact straight away. And, and there's sort of scientists, you know, or, or, or certain type parts of science, it's quite difficult to say what your research will lead to eventually. I just wondered, though, whether actually... This is a bit of a cheat for engineers because I do think that, and this is where I go back to the carbon thing, that because everything's seen through the, you know, engineering to solve um, climate change is the most fashionable thing that you can say and certainly a great way of getting money. Are we in danger of limiting engineering unless we actually argue for blue skies thinking and engineering? I mean, I know that phrase is a bit overworn, but we're just kind of like, absolutely, we don't know how we're... I know it's about problem solving, but there is a point at which maybe it's hemming itself in and limiting itself. So everyone can say what they think about that. Bill, I know that you and Andy have seem to have some disagreements, but you might actually have some disagreements with everybody else because you're that type. I do. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> probably so even you, you, Claire. The, um, well, first of all, just for the record, I never said that the public fears new technologies. It's on film. I've got my speech here. Mm -hmm. So if you set up a straw man, you can win an argument. But I actually agree with Andy right, on one key point, which is that, I mean, he makes the point that um, there are strong interests behind the development of uh, new technologies. But my concern is that, Andy, you simply want to replace those with your own interests. I mean, you yourself have strong interests. I think you'd be the first to admit it. And I have no problem with that. I have strong interests too. And that is democratic debate, and that's what we're engaged in here to some extent. I'm more than happy that we should take our interest to the public, and you can on your one side say, look, we need to hold back, we need to act in a precautionary fashion, this is why, and I will be, you know, make the same speech as I just have uh, and say this is why, and, and let's put it to the electorate. My concern is that you have a tendency of agreeing with the public when they agree with you, so you say, oh, the, the public are being quite right here. And when they disagree with you or act in a different fashion, you want to either ignore them or educate them or regulate them to modify their behavior, by the way, which is, I suspect, something you'd want just as much uh, as Ed. As an aside, the only people you ever say behave to are children. So when the, when the government talks about behavior modification, just bear in mind they're treating you like infants. 
and I think you should rebel accordingly. Andy's got a thesis, you know, one branch of development slows down, but that's all right, it's substituted by another one. I think my concern is that's not true. You know, the, the roots of the tree are all embedded in the same culture. And if the culture is a precautionary one, one that's actually not ambitious, then unfortunately for Scott, it's not going to be that the next decade is the best for engineering ever. Let's be realistic here. R&D spend, and there's a chap at the back, Professor uh, Woodhausen, who's far more qualified than I to, to say this, for, for most major corporates in the world today, something like 0.1% uh, of their profit. You know, that's like... Engineering is, you know, new developments are not happening. En engineering is not about making widgets or things, as Andy's described them. It's a way of taking decisions. And it's a different way of taking decisions to the scientific way. So these are two very, very interesting disciplines that, that, that have a big role in Blue Skies research, which was your question. And I think in the engineering area, it's not about climate change. That's really, you know, history, actually. I would want, want it in systems engineering. It's about taking decisions in the absence of information and getting on and treating our, our world as a system and how you can create a better world for people. So yes, we need blue skies, but it's because of the way of thinking that engineers are trained to bring to a, to a situation that has the extra value. Okay, thanks. Andy? Yeah, I'd like to come from Bill's critique to your question, if I can, uh, Claire. I mean, actually, uh, Bill, I th I, I, th we share a lot, actually, and um, it's a bit boring okay. praising each other for how much we agree, but um, what you said about behaviour change and so on is spot on, I think. Um, but you, it's manifestly the case that if you slow down on some routes, there are compensating effects. I mean, I mentioned a concrete example of wind power. Likewise, all sorts of water use technologies are being pressured by water, perceived, if you like, water constraints. Um, likewise, with ecological farming techniques, pushed, li likewise with alternatives to genetic engineering. Cisgenics, apomixis are coming through because transgenics is under threat. It's manifestly the case that these things occur. You cannot be precautionary on all, on all fronts. And the idea of limits are also constrained. There are limits, you for instance have a view which is perfectly valid, that there are limits to what we can do about security, uh, there are limits to what we can do about behaviour. That's a limit informed debate as well, an environment different from environmental limits, but it's limits nonetheless. So these generic tarring of other people's views as, 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 as deficient. I think it's problematic. Now, yes, I do have my own political views. I'm very much in favour of renewable technologies rather than nuclear power. Um, and I would argue for that in exactly the way you said. I would argue vociferously. But the point I'm trying to make here is one I expect to be more persuasive. I don't expect people to be particularly care mind what I think about nuclear power renewables. I happen to work on it for 20 years, but that's not the point. My point is, these things are political. An expert should not be invoking the authority of engineering rationality, for instance, or any other authority, to be the priesthood who determine it. And I think when I argue that, I'm transcending my own particular views and appealing to something on a more fundamental level. And maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I feel. So to come to Claire's point about Blue Skies research, um, we have to be careful about it. Disciplines have interests. There are whole reductionist programs. There are, you know, they fight each other endlessly. Different schools of biology fight each other, let alone bringing in other disciplines. And Blue Skies research is not just unfettered. It's driven by disciplinary ambitions, personal networks, all sorts of things. It's not an altruistic thing. That said, and, and so as an academic, I'm subject to that as well. That's also a factor which people should qualify. It's a political activity, academia. But in the end, I think your point is right. We should make sure that this valid concern for interrogating the impacts of research doesn't lead us to throw out the value of what we call blue skies. We shouldn't think, though, that blue skies is somehow just determined by nature. We have to look at that critically as well, but we should still do it. Okay, thanks. Ed? Yeah, I was just going to come back on the behaviour uh, sort of uh, modification. I, I uh, find myself slightly surprised to be on this side of the, of the debate, but for me, I've, I've just come back from living four years in Houston, in Texas, and as you drive along the 24-lane freeway called the I-10 going into Houston, with enormous trucks passing you on either side and the massive discrepancy between fuel efficiency in the US versus, uh, versus Europe, you can't help but think there's got to be a better way. So for me, I, I don't think it's for engineers to make people do different things, but unless we encourage people to be far more efficient and effective in the way they use energy on the planet, we do have a loud crunching noise coming towards us. And you can call it behavior modification, you can call it increasing the price of gasoline, you can call it what you like. We've got to do something to help people become more efficient in their daily lives. We're going to need double the energy that we currently have installed in, what, by 2050, I think it was. How much energy plant installation does that actually require uh, in, for example, nuclear versus wind power? And from that, can we just make a rational decision about which is best? 
I'd like to uh, raise a bit of scepticism about the Climate Change Act and actually the way you were describing the impact that it's going to have. Because you used both the Climate Change Act as something that's going to innovate and then you also talked about getting more for less. And in practical terms, since the Climate Change Act has been, come in, what has happened is there's been a huge emphasis on low-cost solutions, like insulating houses. And it's noticeable that the Committee on Climate Change, when they reported this year, they said the emissions in Britain have gone down because there's a recession, but the investment in the technology needed to double the energy output in the UK by 2050 and reduce the emissions hasn't happened. And it's not going to happen with the outlook of trying to do more for less. What you've got to think of is doing more for more and raise the aspirations because I think the, the elements that we're looking for, like Bill was talking about the big solutions, won't happen with a low cost outlook. It's got to be, we need to bid for bigger budgets and more impacts. Uh, there's been a, a remarkable, very strong continuity in all the last three sessions in this room, for those of us who have been through them over the last four hours, um, which is not said as praise to the organisers, but it, it shows how important this question is, which is the one of the natural limits to growth, that we live in a finite planet. And I think the way Ed posed it was one of the more nuanced ways we've heard this with this argument, and I think it highlights the dilemma and the sort of self-fulfilling uh, character of this type of discussion. Because what you said, Ed, was you began by saying that human history is really the, the history of solving problems, and that's sort of innate to mankind. And I think many of us would agree that. That's a very sort of enlightenment, uh, enlightenment perspective. But the end, I want to say that when we look at the limits to envisaging a world with, with 9 billion people in 2050, and particularly on the energy constraints to that, um, you then went on to say, well, even if we put into practice everything we can possibly think of today, it won't be enough. But the whole, problem, the whole point is that problem solving is an ongoing process. The fact that we could think that we can solve every problem and know the solutions to everything today is actually a loss of faith in the fact that we will move forward and progress. Even in the very, and I agree with what Scott's saying, I think the last 40 years, if we take a similar period backwards was a very meager period of innovation. But if you go back 40 years, you could not have envisaged, even in this me meager period of innovation, some of the changes that there have been in terms of the <coughs> World Wide Web, the commercial use of the internet, uh, biotechnology, nanotechnology, and all the sort of things that Scott talked about. So you have expressed in your argument to say, actually, we can't solve these problems. We therefore have to logically change behavior you have expressed a lack of faith in this problem-solving capability of mankind to come up with new solutions to the problems which we'll have over the next 30 and 40 years. And that's how it becomes self-fulfilling. However optimistic we may be as individuals, if we see those limits as the things which represent concrete barriers, then we'll never actually achieve those transformations which Scott talked about, because we'll be uh, uh, victims of that limited imagination. Okay, so Andy, you said we need a politically open debate about the direction of technology. I just want to understand that statement in a global context, namely one where Russia and China are becoming increasingly important in technical and engineering um, innovation. You know, GDP in China is set to overtake that of the US in 2030. Um, these are countries which don't have um, a tradition of politically open debate. I can't imagine a more exciting time to be in the world. I mean, as much as we face huge challenges in every area, isn't that precisely the thing which should drive us to achieve the highest that we could possibly achieve? So my question really is, you know, if we need investment to do that, if that's part of the thing that's holding us back, where should that money be coming from? Is, are we saying that private organizations need to make it a priority? Or are we saying it's a government responsibility? Are we expecting the public to step forward and become donors to say, you know, I want to engineer my own future? And that's true. Where, where should this money be coming from? I think there's a bit of a straw man being thrown up here about changing human behavior because the reality is that technology does change behavior. And behavior then changes technology. Uh, you know, there's always, I think there's a misnomer when people say necessity is the mother of invention. In fact, it's the opposite way around more often than not. 
that through our inventions we change necessity because mankind uses tools in ways that were unexpected, which is the, 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 the real problem that I'm having with quite a lot of what's being said, particularly by what you were saying, Andy, about having, wanting to have this debate about the future direction of technology and how we use it. Because it seems to me that what you're really assuming there, one, you, you're, you're assuming that there's not going to be unexpected outcomes from the use of technologies. You spoke about the web and you spoke about all these technologies that the people are, are taking up. Those were unexpected outcomes. No one designed the web, right? That was an unexpected outcome. The, the great things that we live by today have all been unexpected outcomes, from penicillin to Viagra to, not, not that I, I, I have any personal uh, reason for saying that, but, but <laughs> what it seems to me you are really doing, and I think the, the problem with this, this question about human behavior it's not about altering human behavior, it's about limiting the possibilities of human behavior. And it seems to me that what you're assuming as, inf as finite is human knowledge. If you want to have a debate about the future of technology, you're assuming that the, what we know about technology today is it. I'll end with one story. The father of quantum physics, when he studied physics in 1866 at the University of Munich, was told not to go into physics because everything that needed to be explained about physics had already been done. He discovered quantum, which changed the world. How do we know that there's not another uh, quantum on the horizon in the research that we might be doing today or tomorrow? If you want to limit that by saying that we can only talk about what we know now, you are in fact limiting the horizon of human possibility and that's the, that is the real problem. So there's a huge opportunity for better engineering to deliver more for less. It's not about delivering less for less. That's what you do to your, you know, when you're trying to get the price down. So first point. Second point about the leadership, the, the inspiration. That was a very good question, that one. Lacking investment. It's about creating a context for innovation to take place. I can tell you that from the working office of an engineering company, they are struggling to do their day jobs, let alone think about innovation for the future. But if you change the paradigm, if you change the context in which they're working, as we've been discussing, you suddenly stimulate a whole new way of, of looking at the, the solutions. And I think this is a great opportunity. Uh, first, on um, this massive challenge of climate change, it is very serious. I don't want to, uh, in what I said, appear to be detracting from that. But I'm concerned about the effects of fear. It has the effect of paralyzing us. It has the effect of inducing panic and desperation. And we become very dangerous as a species when we're desperate. And I don't think we need to be. We can take the challenge seriously. It is the biggest single thing we've ever tried to deal with as a society. But you look at the history of canals, <coughs> rail, road, telephones, mobile phones, and you see that when the time is right, technologies take off exponentially. And our source of fear about climate change, and when I say technologies, I mean in a broader sense, not just widgets, but the entire set of practices that go with them. Because none of these things worked without people changing their behavior. That's what made them work. And when the time is right, it really happens. The challenge is to make the time right. And I think uh, a climate of fear and a sense of inability to deal with it is, is the worst problem. On the Russia and China point, I, I, I am really concerned about a kind of xenophobic flavor to some of this debate about, um, about technology. It's about not only a race, but we've got to beat those guys. And just for, in short, the best defense against autocracy, whether that exists in the form that's implied or not, in technology, like elsewhere, is democracy. And so far from my argument being a problem, the more we are democratic about the choices that we make in supposedly democratic countries, which I question, the more this may be the case elsewhere. And then finally, the challenge to me uh, from the uh, Viagra man about, um, <laughs> apologies, sorry, that was, uh, it was unfair, but um, about, about m my discourse being about uh, limits. Absolutely not. Um, Talking about the different directions is, an in, in, in a way, I think we are, at the moment, you are absolutely right on one point. What we are trying to achieve now is a shift of a global infrastructure, of a deliberate kind, of a, of a kind we've never achieved before deliberately. We've done it before as an emergent consequence of things happening. We are trying to do it deliberately now. And you're right to make a distinction there. But I think what I'm talking about, being aware of the directions of technology, even within climate change, and I alluded to them before, is not about limits, it's about the potentialities. It's in a way just like the Enlightenment was us realizing, hey, there is such a thing as progress. What I'm talking about, you could call it an enablement. It's, hey, there's not just such a thing as progress. We can decide the direction of progress. I mean, it's about a stupendous increase in our notion of human agency and ingenuity. So it's not about limits, it's the opposite. I'll just pick a couple of the points. Um, there was a question there about what, you know, what does this energy equation look like in 2050? I think my, I, 
touched on it in my earlier speech, but it, it, essentially the way we look at it, it's all of the oil and gas, all of the nuclear, all of the coal, all of the bio, wind and, and uh, solar energy and, and a few other things that we haven't invented yet, all stacked up together and it still doesn't look like it goes around is, is our, is our uh, sort of uh, hypothesis on it. And, and just to pick up then the question on um, the natural limits to growth that was posed, I'm absolutely not standing here saying and, and therefore we've all got to go home and, and uh, uh, go into a fearful uh, fetal pose in our bedrooms because everything's going to come crashing around our ears. That the issue we've got isn't that we can't invent new forms of, of powering the planet. The issue is it takes an enormous amount of time when you first discover us in the laboratory something that is going to make a difference to when it makes a real practical scale solution for the planet. I'll give you three examples, both in liquefied natural gas, in wind power, uh, and in, in biofuels, it takes 30 years from their sort of original inception to when they become 1% of the world's energy equation. So today, wind power is 1% of the world's energy equation. It's taken us 30 years to get there. It just takes a long time. So my worry about 2050 is not that we won't find uh, the solutions, it's just how long it's going to take us to get there and effectively put those as commercial enterprises on the planet. Well, Andy's made the same point fairly systematically throughout. I mean, he's just answered, look, it's not about limits, it's about a different direction. And previously he said, it's obvious that if you slow down one branch, there'll be growth in another. It seems obvious at a primary school level, but you know, if I chop off your right arm, it may indeed make your left arm become much better, but you probably would have been happier with both arms and more efficient that way. And that's the problem. It's a bit like Margaret Thatcher thought that if you reduced collectivism, you would, re you would realize a growth in individualism. And actually what she achieved was the collapse of both, because strong individuals depend on strong networks. And so that's the problem with this. It's not true that chopping down one side, which you see as a problem, necessarily causes the rest to rise. And this ding-dong occurs throughout these debates. At Copenhagen um, a year ago, I think India and China missed a trick because there's, a, there's an interminable debate between the developing countries and the developed world about who's going to cut back carbon first, yeah? I mean, you, you're familiar with the debate. China and India will say it's for the US and Europe to cut back on carbon because you had the benefit of releasing it first and most of what's in the atmosphere is yours anyway. We need to grow, it's our turn to release it. Europe and America turn back on China and India and say you've got the biggest populations, you're releasing the most now, you're dangerous, you need to, to cut back. No one's ever going to go through that impasse. The only solution, by the way, would be not to argue to cut back, but actually to produce more. That may sound counterintuitive, but it's only by releasing more carbon now that we will achieve lower carbon technologies and lower carbon uh, 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 vehicles and electric vehicles and the such like. And actually what China and India should have argued is that isn't it sad that the West has lost its mojo? You know, we're going to actually be incredibly ambitious. We're going to push ahead. We're not going to ask you to cut back. We're just going to keep pushing ahead and be the vanguard of the new technologies for the new century. Uh, there was one question about one, one quick question about money because somebody asked me directly. I think about uh, you know whose money is going to pay for it. It's not a money problem. It's an aspiration problem. It doesn't matter how much money you throw at a problem if you lack the aspiration. Big Pharma used to put more money into research and development than it does today. Now it puts its money into rebranding itself and reputation management and things like that. There's more money being thrown, but in the wrong direction and with a reduced aspiration, which is bad for both Big Pharma and us as consumers of pharmaceuticals. We keep hearing that the, um, the dates 2050, 2100, it's almost like the future has been almost set out for the next 40 years or whatever. If you imagine back 100 years ago, flight had only just been invented, but within 40 years, we were flying supersonically. And I'm sure over that period, uh, petroleum had, had uh, um, gone from far less, from zero to much more than 1% in that period. Um, so, I mean, given we're talking about engineering the future, it almost feels like, I don't know if anyone remembers, it's a knockout. They used to have this game where they'd tie a bit of elastic to your back, and basically you'd run along, and they'd do on a, a, a greasy floor. You get to the end, and you'd end up putting loads of energy in, but not getting very far. And, and I mean, does the panel think that in some, some way or other, I mean, everything seems to be 30 years in the future from now compared to where it was 100 years ago. As, is it really the case that um, things are moving that slowly or do, do they see any chance in things actually being able to, be able to change to be able to accelerate more as it used to in the past? 
I'm having trouble trying to phrase the question, but I'll, I'll try. I was struck by Bill Gerudi's um, account of what inspires us in public space. And I remember walking past the Apple shop on the morning they launched the iPad, and I was astonished <laughs> to see the queues and to see my students from St. Martin's actually rush out to, 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 to be part of that. And I, I've been thinking a lot about what I've been hearing um, in terms of you know, the, the liberal or the libertarian account um, and about individualism, I suppose. And I, we, we've gone back and forwards about ba behavior modification. And it, you know, the point was made earlier that all design that's popu popular modifies behavior. Hot water regulation, zips, engines, egg wicks, you name it. It modifies what we do and we interact with that. And that has um, a, a special, I suppose, for designers, a special importance that's you know, shouldn't be underestimated or under, misunderstood in terms of process. The problem I have with some of what I'm hearing is that process, the way that designers do that, I'm not an engineer, um, the, the way the battle of ideas is, is um, has, to me, interpreted, it seems that always modification is associated with a sort of form of oppression. But you know, hot water that regulates the, the temperature of the bath you take it's not an oppressive force. And the point I'm, I'm suppose I'm trying to get to is that design which is based on group and user experience that leads to positive change is hardly paternalistic or negative or oppressive. It's fraternalistic and bloody useful. And the valid concerns about energy of the consumption of the nine million, sorry, nine billion, I wish it was nine billion, um, it seems to me poses in, in exciting challenges as well as limits. And I, I, I think that you know, the point was made earlier by one of the speakers that fear of, of limits is a limit. And that I, I, I'm struck that we're going around in circles. Now, I wanted to conclude by saying I want to talk about environmental possibilism, not determinism. And I think if we want to engineer the future, that's what we should be talking about. It's mainly directed at Ed. And it's this extraordinary pessimism over the future in relation to oil. Um, the thing called peak oil, which is talked about a lot in a very panicky way. Um, and I wanted to relate it to you know, the North Sea, which was, uh, oil was discovered about 30 years ago and uh, was said to run out in 10 years. There was new innovation that allowed horizontal drilling that uh, I think more than doubled the uh, accessibility. They found new areas in the North Sea. Um, we've now discovered oil off Brazil in vast quantities. And my, my point is really that it's this, you can't know what's going to come up. Um, there's lots of areas that have not been explored for oil. We may not want to use it, but the availability of it is huge. Um, and so I just wondered if Shell was actually participating in this negative um, stuff by talking constantly about renewables instead of focusing on the fact they could find a hell of a lot more oil for us that will actually serve those 9 billion people nicely. Well, I must say it's amazing... Uh, amazingly inspiring to come to a discussion where uh, someone can say that the only limits to the future is our imagination. Uh, Scott's point, and I think that's great. I mean, there was a discussion in the past where once people used to think they could plan and control the weather. Now that's obviously seen as utter folly. Uh, in the Chinese Olympics, they tried it a little bit with, with the clouds and precipitation, but generally it's seen as, as human folly. I mean, I've just been in a session that counterposed baby boomers against Generation Y. And what was interesting was that the, the Generation Y seemed to be complaining that there's not enough to go around and they have to have it and the baby boomers have taken it all. So my question really is about the, the limit to resources and the cake that we should all share. Uh, but just before I put that question to you, I do think that the point about fear of technology can go alongside loving certain products. So it's certainly the case that with mobile phones, while people love them, the discussion around them has been very morbid and concerned in many instances about cancer, uh, there's been discussions about information overload, about internet stalkers, detrimental health on, uh, impact on children. And the whole discussion generally is that we have too many things and we've gone too far. So my question to the panel really is, should we just argue for better, faster, more for all, without a nervousness about any outcomes? As an engineering student, um, I'm wondering like, what can be done to inspire, inspire the young generation of scientists and uh, engineers, uh, because I see like, this kind of attitude among my peers that, you know, um, like, it's like there's sort of like demotivation or like, lack of inspiration as like, 
I see them like uh, they choose to, when they graduate, they choose to like uh, move into other fields like uh, banks or financial sectors, like uh, bankers in Canary Wharf who will earn much more than like typical engineers in the UK. And like, uh, I see, like, I do agree with that. Um, now the attitudes kind of changed from the age of space exploration. So now like people are more skeptical about the uh, new technology and like if even if the new technology becomes successful, it's something like it's not very well welcomed or before not, like not as surprised as before. So, um, so I guess my question is like, how can you inspire the uh, new generation of scientists, like or like engineers, like who will eventually shape the future? Uh, Bill, you said that when we're being told how to behave, that we're being treated like infants. But surely, the law's treating us how to behave, so maybe you'd like us all to go out on a killing spree, but sometimes we need to be told how to behave because surely it helps us achieve change on a more meaningful scale. Yeah, on, on this point of environmental uh, uh, poss possibilism, uh, if I can say it properly, um, it just seems to me that the problem with it is it's a contradiction in terms, of, because the, the, the whole starting point for environmentalism is, is restraint. It's a recognition that, or, or the idea that we've actually done too much and that we've come too far. Uh, and for me, the, the person that sort of sums it up best is, is the environmental writer Thomas Homer, Homer Dixon, who, who, who argues uh, that the problem today is not that we're too pessimistic, but that we're not pessimistic enough that we uh, continually overestimate what uh, human beings are, are capable of, what our abilities are uh, to achieve, and that we need to rein in our ambitions. And the, the thing about it is that it seems to me that even if we just talk about uh, the, the sort of narrow ambitions of, of, insolv of, of solving environmental problems, uh, that, that we won't get there uh, under, the, under the guise of environmentalism. Because if you look at uh, the New Economics Foundation report recently, uh, they argue against carbon uh, storage and carbon capture because we don't know what will happen if we, if we capture carbon and store it uh, and it might possibly leak up through the ground and, and kill our cats. So even in that sort of narrow ambition, it's not going to work. And, the, 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 and it's not just environmentalists. If you look at uh, Arabs, the, you know, the leading engineers in the world, then they argue uh, that uh, Peter Head from Arabs recently argued that we need to find a way of discouraging development. So even the, the leading engineers are talking about reigning in ambition. I just think that Professor Andrew's strongest argument, really, was that by being precautionary about nuclear, we favoured the development of wind. I was at Science Policy Research Unit training under Professors Freeman and Pavitt 20 or 30 years ago, Andrew, and I think they'd be turning in their graves to hear what you just said. Are you really suggesting that wind, anytime soon, is going to solve China's energy crisis? Do you really believe that in Poland, America, Germany, and all of those coal-dependent nations, that actually we should restrain nuclear power because a few, uh, or maybe more, 10 megawatt turbines are going to want to re rescue those countries from the energy capacity shortage that they uh, uh, will suffer. I think the cu most cursory inspection of their dilemmas shows that they have to continue with coal. They will have to, as Bill de Rodier says, create more carbon dioxide on the way to creating less. They must go ahead with all the risks that are involved with carbon capture and storage. And it is a trope not just of the Greens, but of Stephen Chu, the energy secretary in the United States, that CCS itself could be dangerous. So whichever technology you look at, you will find exactly as Bill says, that the climate against taking risks, against curiosity, and that misanthropic vision of the scientists today is one that impedes all energy technologies. And, you know, uh, uh, you may have done a great job in making planning inquiries into nuclear power make it impossibly expensive. And you may have done a genuinely a great job in raising our awareness of the risks in relation to nuclear waste and the costs to do with decommissioning. But are you really selling, telling me that our research into the nucleus today will never give us a solution 
to dealing with nuclear waste. Are you saying the work at CERN Synchrotron will never give us an answer and that therefore nuclear waste is verboten for the rest of history and we must retire to a dung-driven, rubber-band-powered, windmill... Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. Get on. Get on. <laughs> at the Institute of Ideas, we are interested in identifying social trends and one of the things which we have detected in relation to looking at social policy and government policy and politics in the political sphere is that um, behaviour mo modification has become something it just wasn't talked about when you talked about health in the past or social services or education and now in every single sphere behaviour modification is the answer and that is something that I think potentially threatens freedom and potentially threatens our ability to make choices. So for all the rhetoric about choices, actually, it's not there. It's kind of, uh, you are free to make the right choices, but if you make the wrong choices, you're in trouble. And even with the new coalition, we have a kind of nudge theory that tries to nudge us to make the right choices. I would suggest, in agreement with Andy, that who are they to say what the right choices are? I want to, you know, they, what they think is the right choice might be the one that I don't want to take. I don't want to be nudged away from smoking or drinking or behaving in particular ways, thank you very much. I do understand the risks, I've got all that, I'm a grown-up, and so on. So it's about that side of it. And I think, therefore, in relation to energy, that's still uh, part of, I think, what can go on. It's not to be over-literal is the point. I do understand that technology changes behaviour. I'm not saying every change in behaviour is a bad thing. I'm talking about it in the policy context of today as a social trend. And then the second thing I really wanted to just take issue with was just, and it's not because actually there's a lot of what Andy says I, I do agree with, but one of the things that he said, which I just think I should at least clarify as well, was that climate change is the largest, biggest thing that we have to deal with as a society. And I just disagree. I do not think it is the largest, biggest thing that we have to deal with as a society, which is not the same as saying I don't think that we have to deal with climate change. I do not consider that. That is something I think needs to be debated. I think the f attacks on freedom, attacks on our autonomy, and the attack on the Enlightenment way of thinking is the biggest threat, or, you know, they're m some of the things, as it goes, that I think. I think this government should have an industrial policy, for want of a better term. I want to know what its economic policy is. I think it needs to build a bit. I do not want to sit there and constantly be told that I am part of a debate which asks me which cut I want to make. That is not the only answer. And so I think that the engineering the future both... Um, is, a, 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 as it were, a problem of our lack of imagination, all the things that people have said, but I, but I don't think the idea that there is no money in the bank is just not true. There is money in the bank, what are we going to spend it on? And actually, even if there's no money in the bank, this is money worth borrowing to invest in the future so that we can have economic growth in the future. We have to invest, we have no choice in the sense that otherwise we will constantly be told you have to choose which bit of your life you're stopping. And I don't want to stop. I want more. So that's the kind of way that I think we should look at this question beyond being an engineer uh, uh, more politically. So in the reverse order, picking up anything they want, final thoughts for the uh, day are starting with Scott. Thank you, Claire. And you're absolutely right. Everybody does want more. So the, role, you know, the challenge we've got is how to deliver more. The, the, the point about the innovation cycle is very interesting, and I'm glad it's come out this afternoon, because we do have, across the industry, a cycle which is maybe 20 years uh, to, from, from concept to, to delivery. That's far too long. We can't deliver all these aspirations that you have in that period. We need ways to deal with it. But we don't have the freedom of the earlier innovators to do things on the fly. We don't have, the, fortunately, the pressure of all-out war to drive those sorts of innovations. We do have an immensely complex regulatory structure, both in the UK and in the European Union. And we do have a very, very uh, intense public intolerance of failure. And that you see commonly in the media. It's really delightful that it has not come out in the debate this afternoon. But the intolerance of failure leaves on the line or whatever it is. Very, very serious driver. Um, we're not saying that, 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 that the engineering profession is here offering you to take those choices for you. What the engineering profession is offering is to help society make informed decisions. Because we can tell you, just as you would ask all sorts of other professions for advice, how to inform the decision that we as society want to take. So allowing us to take up new concepts, we don't know yet what is going to come about in the next 30 years, but we can't plan our future expecting that they will arrive. We need to plan an engineering future 
which allows for new concepts, materials, solutions to become embedded into that trajectory that we're already on, not to find that we're at some huge conflict with some great new idea. So it's about accelerating a trajectory that, as a society, uh, we want to deliver. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, Bill, your thoughts, please. Uh, well, firstly to Lorraine German from uh, St. Martin's College. Lorraine, I've got no problem at all with you and your course at St. Martin's where you teach people art and design in relation to securing bicycles, securing handbags, and indeed it's really a security course, isn't it, with a bit of art and design. My concern is that let a million flowers bloom, you know, and like, you know, let other people try and fire people's imagination about art and design in other directions. Um, and that may have a greater impact, oddly enough, on lowering crime than simply securing our bicycles and handbags. Uh, in the same, there's a similar debate in architecture. That, you know, architecture is now essentially building fortresses against terrorists rather than actually necessarily inspiring stuff that might inspire a few people not to become terrorists. To the young man who suggested that we should all be told how to behave at some point, well, Ben, you're my 16-year-old nephew, and it's for my brother to tell you how to behave. Um, I, I guess, you know, in a couple of years' time, you know, aside from breaking the law, basically, I think you, you will enjoy the autonomy that um, comes from not being told, you know, what to drink, how, you know, whether to smoke and all the other things that this government, uh, and particularly the previous one, uh, thought was the important things. Just wanted to finish on um, a few points quickly on the precautionary principle, because it's been mentioned but not really um, dissected. I mean, quick points. The precautionary principle is illogical to itself. Because if you really thought that before doing anything you need to check that um, acting in a particular way is not dangerous, then before applying the precautionary principle, you would have to fully assess the consequences of applying the precautionary principle, uh, which people don't do. S secondly, I have no, you know, I have a concern, with, you know, that it, it does migrate from one thing to another. I can understand Andy's point about, you know, we need to be cautious about the motives of elites but it rapidly becomes cautious about motivation in general uh, and cautious about ourselves and about experimentation and it's a very rapidly expanding thing and if you want an example of that you only have to look at how Tony Blair turned the precautionary principle to good use in relation to Iraq because he said not having the evidence of weapons of mass destruction is not a reason for inaction in relation to Saddam. That was an application of the precautionary principle, which I suspect Andy would dispute and not go along with, but it shows you how people pick and choose when they wish to apply the precautionary principle. Very last thing, the only resource that matters is our resourcefulness. Um, and you know, I think that point's been made several times in this room today. Just to pick up on the point around, you know, all we need to design better consumer goods and, and, and we'll all be happy. I think there is quite a big difference between consumer goods and public goods. And, and the environment is a public good and it's very difficult to completely resolve all of the issues around the environment simply by making a, a, a nicer looking iPhone. So I think there is a role for public policy in this and we can call it regulation, you can call it laws, but I think there has got to be a public policy debate around how we want to address the environment. So that's just one point I want to get off my chest, thank you. Um, to the gentleman on peak oil, I'm absolutely with you. I'm actually not a pessimist. I'm actually quite optimistic. We are at the frontiers and perhaps linking into the, the, the a gentleman at the back who wanted to be inspired. We're absolutely at the frontiers today of developing more and more energy from more and more diverse sources and mitigating the effects of that energy on the planetary system. Hundreds of billions of dollars are going to be spent on that in the coming decades and I'd really like you to be part of that. I'm really excited about it, whether it's exploring in the Arctic, whether it's making uh, carbon capture and storage work efficiently and effectively. There is an enormous challenge out there and we nearly, really, really need to be part of it if we're going to make a success success of it. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm not a pessimist, I'm an optimist about it. First, Claire, most serious problem facing us, absolutely, the mo in my opinion, the most serious problems facing us are poverty and the scale of our preparations for violence, war. Uh, these are the challenges. I, what I said about uh, climate change was is the, it is the biggest challenge we've taken on. We've taken it on at a high level internationally and we've never done that before. Um, Professor Woodhausen's uh, emotional uh, incredulity over even the possibility that we might embark on a future without nuclear power. Um, well, first of all, uh, Chris Freeman, who you mentioned, who founded the institute I'm, uh, um, I'm at now, uh, sadly died six weeks ago. I can tell you absolutely that he entirely agreed with me on this point about other options presenting a choice. In fact, he wrote a book uh, basically articulating exactly those points. 
Um, we can achieve a future without nuclear power. That doesn't mean we should. I happen to think we should, but that's not what I'm trying to persuade people of. I'm trying to persuade people that we should not be going around telling us we cannot do it, because we can. Um, and a, a variant to this point, on the, on the monocultures and diversity line, Professor S uh, Sir David King made the argument in favour of nuclear power repeatedly, there's no alternative. When challenged on that by various people, and I've witnessed it many times, including by me, he repeated very quickly to, we should do everything. And we should be careful of arguments for democracy based on let's do everything, therefore do the thing I want us to do in the first place. It is possible to address these challenges in a diverse way with any one of the options we've been discussing missing from the mix. We can do this technologically. Um, so we shouldn't be desperately panicked into thinking we have to do X or Y because of diversity. On Bill's point on precaution... Very quick now. Please, yeah. Um, uh, precaution just means take uncertainty seriously. Look for the values, look for the driving interests. Don't just think that knowledge is presented on a plate. The metaphor of chopping the arm off is the wrong metaphor. If we have a biological metaphor for, evolu for, for innovation, it is evolution. It goes in many directions, and that's the metaphor that tells us that when certain branches are suppressed, others flourish. Um, and it's actually then about, about can, it's about can do. It's about we can, this idea of, I love the phrase environmental possibilism, when a species finds itself under, spread, under stress, new species arise. Finally, behavior. Um, I think the behavior change we should be talking about is behavior change on the part of politicians and incumbent organizations of whatever kind, business and NGOs, who are in privileged positions and won't accept the validity and viability of alternatives. And we should be speaking about technology at every level, about the choices that we face, and getting away from that, that kind of behavior of treating it as just one track. Innovation, we should be talking about the public as innovating as well. So that what we call now controlling behaviour change should be about innovating. The public can innovate too. They have done. That's why these technologies flourish. And, and that's an upbeat account of, of the potential for public engagement in changing our energy mix and uh, a response to climate change. Sorry, okay. Claire. No, it's okay. Can we just thank a fantastic panel for making engineering sexy? Really great.